Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. I'm your host. Um, the, this light that you see shining on me means that, as you probably remember, this is God's favorite YouTube channel. So, um, today's December 3rd. Some interesting stuff happened on this day, some horrible stuff. The first thing that happened, well, it wasn't the first thing, but it, this was horrible. In 1984, in Bhopal, India, a Union Carbide chemical plant, Union Carbide, um, released poisonous gas, I, I assume not on purpose, and it killed between 15 and 20,000 people. Again, this was in Bhopal, India. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have suffered, you know, injuries and medical problems since uh, because of that. Um, on this day in 1948, uh, one of the greats, Ozzy Osbourne, was born, 1948. On this day in 1818, the state of Illinois became the state of Illinois. Illinois became a state. Um, what? A, oh, in 1755, um, Gilbert Stewart was born. And you might say, well, why do I care about Gilbert Stewart? I don't even know who Gilbert Stewart is. Well, Gilbert Stewart is, um, or was, an artist, a portrait painter. And you probably would know many of his famous works. And, you know, because he painted like a lot of people that are famous in American history. Gilbert Stewart was born in Rhode Island, by the way. Um, and the reason I mention him is because if it weren't for people like Gilbert Stewart, we would have no idea other than written descriptions, but you know, the saying a, a picture is worth a thousand words. We would have nothing other than written descriptions about people from that period and before. Like there's a famous picture of Henry VIII that, you know, is widely known. I think that's probably what Henry VIII looked like, but keep in mind, Henry VIII died in the late 1500s so and the reason i say i'm pretty sure that's what henry the eighth looked like or at least that's what henry the eighth thought he looked like is because no one could get away with painting a famous person especially the king of england and having it be like some picasso-esque uh caricature or portrait it had to reflect what those people thought they looked like. Um, but Stewart painted people like George Washington and John Adams and, and a lot of famous people. And, you know, the, the picture of Washington on the dollar bill is not from a photo. Like, Lincoln's on the $5 bill, Grant's on the 50 They all had their pictures taken, you know, when they were alive and you know Jackson's on the 20 now Jackson was the first president to have his photo taken although John Quincy Adams had his photo taken and he was president before Jackson um, after he was president actually John Quincy Adams finished being president and then went back into con ran for Congress and went back in he was just like it wasn't a big deal it was like somebody's got to be president I'll be president for a while you know, but then I'll go back into Congress. Uh, but but anyway, it's important. These artists are important because they they were the documentarians of their day. We didn't have, we certainly didn't have cameras. We didn't have daguerreotypes or any other thing back in you know the 18th century. So everything that we see about those periods before that is based on artist renderings. And, you know, and I'm sure we've all seen like pictures or likenesses of what people think Christ looks like. None of those are really based on anything like I don't think Christ ever sat for a portrait 
during his day. But um, in later centuries, that was something that happened. And normally it was the rich and famous that sat for them. Um, but then if you study art history at all, you know that at some point, especially like the Dutch masters, like Bruegel, they started painting common people, like pastoral scenes, like farms and, and things that were not just rich and famous people like the King of England or George Washington. So anyway, that's why I, I'm always, I always share stuff about those artists because I think their art documents history. So um, what else is going on? Okay, so I gotta exhale for a second here. I've never been a, a fan of Florida State. I'm not a Seminoles fan, I'm not a fan, I'm not a Gator fan either, by the way. Uh, and I used, it used to chat my hide because I, I, I used to have to be in Panama City, Florida um, for different reasons. And when I was there and, and I wasn't, you know, working, I would have a room at the queue and I'd, you know, I'd watch like on the weekends, I'd watch football and stuff. And especially up in the panhandle, everybody was all about Florida State and Bobby Bowden was the coach at the time. And I always disliked the fact that Bobby Bowden was kind of a whiner about, you know, Florida State getting, you know, getting votes to be the national champion. And so I, I kind of was hoping that lobbying and whining would go out of style with the advent of the college football playoff. But this weekend's events have proved me wrong. Now, first of all, I wouldn't trust any guy who allows himself to be called boo, any grown ass man that allows himself to be called boo in a, in a professional setting. It's okay if your grandma calls you boo, but you know, not a professional setting. So there's this guy named Boo Corrigan, who, by the way, took over for Gary Barta, who was the a, who was the AD at Iowa. But Boo Corrigan apparently is the AD at North Carolina State, and he was ahead of the CFP committee. And those are the morons who thought that Alabama, with one loss to another team that's in the CFP. Um, in the playoff, Texas, they lost to Texas at home and Alabama somehow gets, with that loss, gets picked over Florida State who has no losses. Now, and, and that's, our, that's scandalous enough to begin with. But then the excuse that this boo guy gives on national TV is that, um, and I think the kid's name is Jordan Travis, or Travis Jordan, I might have, a, I, I'm pretty sure I'm close. But he's the quarterback and he broke his leg. But they're still 13 and 0. They still won their conference championship. They beat, you know, teams from other conferences, like they beat, this, they beat LSU. You know, they did everything that was asked of them. And, they're a major program who has been a national champion in the past. Referencing back to the Bobby Bowden era. And the idea that, and so this Boo Corrigan guy, he says, well, the reason the committee picked Alabama over Florida State is because Florida State's quarterback broke his leg. Now, if that's not the stupidest reason for snubbing a team, I I don't know what is. Like, I don't know if, you know, I mean, the only reason I could think of that would be stupider is that like, well, we can't have anybody with burgundy in the playoff. We just, we don't like burgundy. But that, but you know, the team is still 13 and 0. It doesn't matter how they got there. They're they're a, they are the first power 5 undefeated school 
to not to get excluded from the college football playoff, to get excluded from the top four. And it's arbitrary and capricious. And let me just put this out here and, and Boo and his buddies on the CFP committee can prove otherwise. But I smell a rat. I think that that, you know, scam artist that runs the SEC, I don't even know what his name is, probably something like, I don't know, Bubba or some shit. But I'm pretty sure there was envelopes stuffed with cash passed to these people. The guy, the guy is the AD at NC State. He's not a big deal. I mean, he might be in Raleigh, but that's about it, right? He's not even at UNC. And, you know, the only thing I can think of is th they were in the tank for Alabama. And Nick Saban's whining like a la Bobby Bowden, except there wasn't a CFP when Bowden was around, is, you know, there was a payoff, right? There was there was there were bribes paid to get a, an SEC team in the the game or in the playoff and Saban and his minions started the lobbying even before the SEC championship game you know they didn't take care of business with Texas but they were like oh you know it would be an injustice N no it's not an injustice it's just college football and you make a shit ton of money, but you want you want an even bigger bonus. So I I'm very certain um, that the CFP was paid off to make this decision. And until somebody proves they weren't, that's what I'm going with. Because other than that, like you can't come up with a plausible. You know they they're like oh well you know Florida State's not at full strength. You know what's not at full strength, boo? Your freaking IQ. You suck. And everybody in the state of Florida knows you suck. And everybody around America knows you suck. Reese Davis basically said, as soon as the cameras went off, that guy sucks. So, boo, you can just suck on it. I hope that Florida State fans just go up to, uh, go up to Raleigh and do donuts with their monster trucks on his front lawn because he deserves every bit of shit he gets over this. Okay, so, and by the way, you know, Iowa's my team. They got shut out. Oh, by the way, though, a, a, a cool thing that happened with Iowa football today, even though, you know, they were a little disappointed about the outcome in Indianapolis, I don't think it was a huge surprise. But what, what happened was the Patriots and the Chargers played today, and apparently... Both the players on the Chargers and the players on the Patriots, you know, told their coaches, hey, we don't we ain't playing on Sunday. We're not going, none of us are going to the playoffs. We don't even give a shit. We're not going. So what what the NFL did was they got a hold of the Iowa team that was in um, Indianapolis. They flew them to um, they flew them to, I think the game was played in New England, if I'm not mistaken. They flew them up to Foxborough. And then they also got the Nebraska Cornhuskers to fly to Foxborough. Um, you know, the Cornhuskers are not going, you know, they're not going to be in a bowl game this year. So it was an opportunity to play an extra game. And so what happened is Iowa suited up as the as the San Diego Chargers. Yeah, I know they're in Los Angeles, but they're the San Diego Chargers to me, just like it's the Sears Tower to me. And so Iowa's guys suited up as the San Diego Chargers, and Nebraska came out in the old school Patriots uniforms as the Patriots. You know, they like playing in red clothes anyway. And so, uh, and, and the score reflects the fact that Iowa and Nebraska played their second game this year because it was 6-0 was the final score with the Iowa Chargers winning the game over the, over the Nebraska Patriots. So anyway, that's a wrap up of, of college slash pro football for today. I did want to talk about something that's been on my mind for a while and I... I was talking about this with a, a friend 
and actually a couple of friends recently, but I, I've come up, you know, I, I often have like ideas or I see a problem, but I don't yet have a solution, but I have actually come up with another brilliant solution for this problem. So, I believe that, and, and my solution is gonna prove this by the way, I believe that there are a number of drivers on the road in the OTR space. And here's, and let, let me preface this by saying, I, let me tell you what the, the, the underlying problem is and then the problem that's causing the underlying problem. So the underlying problem is that in this industry, in the, especially in the OTR space, there's too much capacity. Um, you know, I've talked about that in the past. And basically that's another way of saying there are too many trucks for the number of loads that need to be hauled. And that forces um, freight rates down and it, you know, it's, it's more people cutting up one pizza basically. Um, but part of the problem with trucking, especially irregular route truckload carriers like Prime and Crete and Knight Swift and you name it, right? Anybody that you probably see at a Walmart distribution center is that there are so many slack jawed fly by night companies that are also operating in the space. Now, normally I, you know, I wouldn't have an issue with slack jawed fly by night companies, except that I'm fairly positive that the, a number of those companies have drivers that either A, don't have a CDL at all, B, have a CDL that's expired, C, don't have a medical card, D, have drivers who have failed drug tests and may or may not be registered with the clearinghouse. And the reason I say that is that I think there's almost no risk to some slack-jawed fly-by-night company for employing people who truly do not have a CDL or whose CDL would place the driver, status would place the driver out of service. And I think that, that there are guys, I mean, you see it in the middle of the night, right? You see these, you see these pile of crap, you know, Volvos and Freightliners with the hood mirrors ripped off, the bumpers ripped off, you know, no steps on the passenger side, and some least rented piece of crap trailer fly into a truck stop at the middle of the night and like three or four guys get out of that truck, right? And I'm telling you right now that what's going on is that maybe not all of those drivers, but some of them are not permitted to drive a commercial motor vehicle in the United States. It's just that simple. And, but, but you say, well, why would these companies do that? Well, the answer is because there's no real penalty for doing so. They, you know, there are people that come to this country on like tourist visas that allow them, I think, to stay like 90 days. In 90 days where you just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth across the country and some, you know, unscrupulous clown in New Jersey or California pays you seven cents a mile and, and if you think I'm joking, you're kind of naive. That, that person can then take that money and go back home, having made in 90 days more than they would make in a year in their home country. And, and I, and the, but the only way that this is gonna stop, because you know, I can't remember the last time I was in a way station or you know any of those types of areas where I saw any trucks you know getting like inspected I mean it's exceedingly rare and you know a lot of drivers talk about oh DOT's up in my grill and it's just you know they're all in my stuff and you know I can't even make a living out here I I can't 
I mean, I've been inspected since I've been at Prime, and you know, I may get one tonight, right? Or tomorrow, but it's not very frequent. I mean, it's, it's seldom that it happens. And you see these trucks, and you're like, there's no way that everything is hunky-dory with that truck and those drivers. There's just no way. And those of us who work for, you know, carriers that are doing it right, we're suffering because of the lawlessness of these slack-jawed, unscrupulous, fly-by-night operators. And here's the thing, even if their drivers get shut down, worst case scenario is some of these guys, worst case scenario, they get deported. They just, they're just told, and by the way, when you get deported to like overseas, overseas, not, I'm not saying like Mexico, they, they're just like, okay, they give you a piece of paper that basically says you have this many days to get out of the country. Unless you've committed a felony, unless you, you're under arrest for a felony, they're just like, you have 14 days to get out of America. And, you know, don't come back until we tell you you can come back or something. That's it. And these motor carriers, right, people that have MC numbers, all they do is if the company gets shut down, they just take that truck that these guys were running back and forth, back and forth, that the truck that they bought, it's some hunk of junk anyway, they either just get a new truck or, and, and they just get a new MC number. I mean, there, there's been case after case after case where companies were shut down by FMCSA and just turned around and moved the assets to other companies, got more drivers. And the answer for why would they do this is because it's lucrative. It's lucrative. If you can undercut a large carrier or even a legit small carrier, if you're willing, if you're paying guys, and I'm not, again, I'm not joking about this. If you're paying guys seven cents a mile, you're paying the lead driver 17 cents a mile, and you're just running balls to the walls, back and forth, back and forth, you can haul for 90 cents a mile. Because all you're basically buying is fuel and insurance and you know you got some stickers. But when you're when you're turning over loads every two or three days, you can make you can make plenty of money when you're when you have almost no driver costs. I mean think about it, you see these guys washing their feet in the sink at a truck stop. You think that's a guy that's pulling down six figures a year driving a truck? I don't think so. I've seen guys taking a shower with a water bottle in the parking lot. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so enough about the problems, the two problems, hurting legit operators and legit truckers and how they're doing it. I propose that the large trucking companies, and you know all their names, that belong to the American Truckers Associate, or Trucking Association, the ATA. I propose that via the ATA, they funnel money to states to pay for overtime for state troopers and other law enforcement people and DOT officers and they start doing blitzes, and this will be a little bit painful for everybody, right? But they start, they start doing blitzes that, that cause every single semi on the road, or straight truck for that matter, to pull into a way station, and every single person on the truck to show ID, and you know, so like, like, if I got pulled in, there, I'm, there's only one human on my truck. It's, it's well, there's B, too. It's me, right? Only one human. So I would have to show my CDL, my valid, not expired CDL, and my valid, not expired medical card. After I showed that, I, I could be on my way. They're not going to inspect the truck. They're just going to inspect me. Now, if there's more than one driver everybody's got to show their IDs 
and then the logs get checked to make sure that if there's not, you, you know, we want to make sure that there's not one licensed driver who says the other three guys are just his cousins visiting from Bangladesh. And, you know, but yet that truck's been moving, you know, it's in Nebraska and it hasn't stopped since it left Salinas, California. Okay. But here's what we, that is so weird that it's like, I don't know. It's like there's a, maybe this is the second coming. I don't even, that's bizarre. <laughs> it's like there's a dust storm right here, but there's really not. So what, I, and, I, and by the way, I'm totally serious about this. I think that the big companies like the Primes, Crete, Night Swift, you know, KLLM, all these big companies, especially in the dry van and reefer space, they should put up the money and just funnel it through the ATA so there's not a lot of hard feelings because people will be like, oh, those prime drivers suck even worse because their company put up money and I had to stop and I failed a piss test or whatever. But let's get drivers off the road. Let's reduce capacity by getting everybody off the road that's not legal to run. Again, I'm not worried about their tire tread depth. But we're losing money to unscrupulous conduct. And we, drivers at companies like mine, spend way too much time worrying about getting an inspection when they should welcome 10x, 100x of the inspections that we get. I think in my entire trucking career, which is since April of 2019, I think I've been in, I was never inspected at night. I got a level three once when I was at Shugel. I got a level three once at, at GP Transco, and I've had two inspections. I've had a level three and a level two while I was at Prime. And by the way, the level three when it was when I was bobtail. This guy was checking a box, right? He's like, all right, that direction, all right, you got electronic clocks? All right, I'll be right back. Seriously, that's, <laughs> so that's it, right? That's it. I could run for months at a time without a CDL and no, and, and here's the thing, even when shippers ask for my CDL or receivers, they don't verify that it's, that it's valid. They don't know if I have a medical card. I have I have three CDLs in my wallet, two of which are expired and were from Pennsylvania. But I just still have them in my wallet. So and because honestly, I don't like giving my ID out. So sometimes when they ask for, I just give them one of the old Pennsylvania ones. They look at, they're like, all right, here, go go to this door. They don't check. But I want. I, when I say a blitz, I mean, I want like to pay like the state of Illinois, for example, because they have so many interstates. You never get weighed in Illinois. I mean, it's very rare. Let's pay, let's have the ATA through its members pay, or its members through the ATA, I guess, pay the state of Illinois, say, hey, look, we're going to give you a $3 million grant for overtime. And we want you to stop every stinking truck that comes in your state at every stinking way station. Like if you hit two way stations going across I-70, fine. You got to stop at both. You got to show your ID. You're, you got to prove you're legit to drive a truck. Every single state. And I would target, I would target states like Wyoming. Uh, I would target states like New Mexico, I would, Illinois would be one, um, Georgia might be another because there's so many interstates running through there, but I, I would give grants to say, I'd be like, hey, here's $3 million, check everybody's license. I'm sure these states would do this. I'm sure these troopers would enjoy having the overtime because it's easy, right? It's like, you just, you don't have to, you just stand there and, and check stuff, right? Everybody comes to you. And anybody, anybody, I don't care how long the line is, you know, put out signs, put out cones, I don't care. Anybody that goes past that way station, 
immediately they go, just like in Monopoly, they go straight to jail. I don't care if the line's like 400 trucks long. You're going to jail, buddy. You, you jump the line, you're done, right? We're putting you out of service. That ice cream's gonna melt on the side of the frickin' highway. So anyway, and, and by the way, I, I am not, I, I said this earlier, but I'm not joking. I'm gonna email Robert Lowe and I'm gonna ask that whoever Prime's rep is with the ATA strongly consider doing this because I think it's a great investment. I think it would immediately reduce capacity and we and and business would pick up because I don't think business is down that much. I just think there's too much capacity. And we can and we can fix that by ensuring that everybody's running legal. So thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you guys later. And by the way, don't name your kid Boo.